we had been talking about uh, in our discussions here um, before the broadcast was that you just need to be really careful about how you define success uh, and making sure that you define your expectations appropriately since you're dealing with folks who've had to come a long way to get where they are um, and, and have a long way to go. And you don't want to set the bar too high, as some of our previous panelists have said. So Danny, what's your reaction to, to, to these comments? Well, that's absolutely true, that success uh, will be measured offender to offender, and you look at realistic goals. Uh, but to get an overall picture, uh, in West Virginia, uh, Southern, we do gather those stats monthly as to how many folks are employed, how many folks do have at least a high school education or GED, and then we compare them to the state statistics. Mm -hmm. So uh, that does give us a gauge in how we're doing, and our goal is always to uh, beat the state statistics, and fortunately, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Brian, reactions? In Southern District of Texas, the um, cognitive skill training, we don't have any statistical information, but basically word of mouth feedback from my colleagues, um, the offender upon entering the R&R &R program is thinking differently, is acting differently, um, not as um, confrontational during office visit. He appears to be making some changes. Mm -hmm. The offender themselves saying, you know, I didn't really accept this program from the beginning, but I really think that I can benefit from this, the tools that they're be, being mm -hmm. taught and that they will use it and they will take their, they will do the exercises, they will participate in the role play mm -hmm. and you can see the positive change. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our success is based upon what the offenders are saying to us, mm -hmm. what they're saying to their officer of supervision mm -hmm. and what that officer is saying to us. Mm -hmm. is making us is making us believe that we have a successful program. Mm -hmm. So you need to actively listen and, yes. and to what's going on with the offenders and make sure that they are hanging with the program. Yes. Very interesting. Uh, New York Western, anything further to add? Uh, Mark, I don't really think we have anything that hasn't been touched on. Okay. I, again, I guess this is Colleen, by the way. I would just um, emphasize that the people who are running whatever the program is, if there's not a personal commitment on their part, right. then the program isn't going to fly. Because if there's one thing our offenders do really well, it's they read people. And if they're reading that people are there just going through the motions and not really committed to helping them uh, change or improve their lives, then the program's just not going to work. I, I think that that is a really good place to leave it because ultimately this is a program that's about the offenders and defendants if we're in a pretrial setting. And by the way, I know that there are pretrial employment assistance programs. In fact, I, uh, I believe Jackie Peoples gave me a call uh, earlier and has written an article in Federal Probation on setting up a pretrial services employment assistance program. So let's just leave it there. We can't really get anything better, any better than that. So thank you, Colleen. Thank you, panelists. Uh, once again, it's time to sum up. So let's take a moment to review what we've discussed as we move around to get ready for our last panel. Before we get to our final segment, uh, I, my understanding is that we've got a, a phone call on the line, Pamela from New York. Pamela, are you with us? Hi, it's me again. Mark. Hi, how, how are, are you? you? I just wanted to add to the previous segment um, when Great. you were talking about uh, influencing um, the offenders. Here at Southern District of New York, we also ran groups where we had offenders who were actually successful come in and discuss you know, the avenue, the roads that they took to overcoming um, their obstacles. And I don't know, we just found um, when we had like the motivational type group settings mm -hmm. where they talked, they fed to one another, they actually encouraged each other when they were, ha you know, when they presented negative attitudes. And we found that was a lot, it was very beneficial in, in making the offender move forward because they saw someone like themselves 
who had also done time, who had also had the same hindrances, and they succeeded in, you know, whatever job, whether it was medical, whether it was labor, mm-hmm. um, tech, you know, technological, it didn't matter, but it was very helpful. And I just wanted to add that as a, a good part of any type of um, employment training program to bring the success stories back in to talk to the offenders. I'm glad you raised that point, uh, if, if only because back in the clip, particularly the, the Texas Western probation clip, we saw uh, one of the offenders talking about the level of distrust that exists between offenders and probation officers and how that has to be overcome. And maybe this is one way of having them overcome that. So I really appreciate your calling and making that point. Uh, you really sort of helped sum it up very well. All right, we're going to move on uh, to the final panel. Um, the, this final segment is mitigating life skills related conflicts. Uh, Danny Kuhn is still here from our last panel and is now joined by Scott Ballack, U.S. Probation Officer from the District of Nevada. Welcome, Scott. We're going to show you, as we've done in the past, a brief video vignette to help focus our discussion. U.S. Probation Officer Keith Johnson receives a phone call from Gina Scott the adult daughter of convicted felon Stephen Scott. Stephen is not married and served 12 months for a single charge of telemarketing fraud. He has been on supervision now for four months. Hello, Officer Johnson speaking. Hello, Officer Johnson. This is Gina, Gina Scott. You're assigned to my father, Stephen. You saw him last week. You know, the phone swindling thing? Yes, I know Stephen. What's wrong? got to do something. We really got into it this morning. I can't take him anymore. Okay, now just take a deep breath, start over from the beginning, and tell me what happened. You know that I live with my father, right? Well, it's like we're living in the dark ages. He never pays the electricity. The power's always going out. And it's not like he doesn't have the money. You know he has a steady job. I swear I've had it with him. Did you say you had some kind of fight? We always fight over money. Only this morning, as I was telling him for the umpteenth time to get over to the power company and pay the bill, he starts in on me. I mean, if I hadn't left, who knows what would have happened. Sounds pretty serious. Now, Gina, are there any other problems? What else is going on? He never pays any bills. Or in those rare instances when he does, they're never on time. And then we have bill collectors calling us. (sighs) Can't you do something? You said if we ever had a problem to call. Well, I'm calling. And I'm glad you did, Gina. Look, I'll try to meet with your dad today to discuss it. Now, where can I reach you if I need to? Fighting with your daughter, Stephen. I know you and Gina aren't always like this. What's going on? Well, we never did get along when it comes to money. She doesn't think I can handle it. Steve, I have to tell you, fighting with your daughter, having your utilities turned off repeatedly, and dodging bill collectors aren't exactly good signs. Things like this could spin out of control. Well, I guess I just forget. And then by the time I remember, it's either too late or I spent my paycheck on something else. Okay, let me suggest this. Why don't we get everyone together? You, Gina, me, and maybe we should include your boss. Uh, Alex Marshall, right? Yeah, since she's the one who cut your paychecks. Maybe if we get everyone together, we can find a solution that suits everyone's needs. Calling Alex isn't really necessary, is it? I mean, she's my boss, you know. She really doesn't have to know anything about this. No, I think she should know. If you want a workable solution, we need to get inputs from everybody. I'll set up something for tomorrow night and let you know. One time, I went even my father. <sighs> Don't oh, exaggerate. Okay, okay, okay. Let's everybody step back for a minute. Bickering's not going to get us anywhere. We've already discussed a few ways to work this out. Let's see if we can make one or two of them actually work. Alex, what do you think about these ideas? Well, we certainly have some options. One thing I could do is release Stephen's check to Gina. What? You can't do that. That's my money. Wait, Stephen. Don't be so quick to dismiss this idea. Let's talk about it. It's still your money, and your name would still be on the check. Right, Alex? Of course. But by giving it to Gina, at least you know the money is still there when you need it. Yeah, Dad. Look, 
Gina can open up a new family account with both your names on it and set it up so that both of your signatures are required for withdrawals. You know, that's a good idea. My business partner and I have that set up on a corporate account. And really having that check and balance system in place is good. Both of us would then know when, not to mention where the money is going. Well, I think I could live with that arrangement, Dad. Well, to be honest, I hate the idea. I guess as long as my name was on my paycheck and both of our names were on the account. Look, Steve, this is only a temporary fix. You, me, and Gina are going to have to get together to find a way to help you be more responsible with your money. But until we do that, this is how it's going to be. Alex will release Steven's paycheck to Gina. Gina will open a new family account with both your names on it, and both of your signatures will be required for withdrawals. Has everybody agreed? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks a lot for coming out this evening, Alex. It was my pleasure. Take care, Gina. And Stephen, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hold up, guys. We need to set up some time to talk about budgeting. All right, let's get right to it, since uh, we got a lot to talk about and not a whole lot of time to talk about it. Uh, gentlemen, based on your experience, um, what factors might have prevented the offender's money management problems from coming to the officer's attention before the conflict arose? Scott, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I should say, first of all, that this case is based upon a case that my partner and I, Tim Jenkins, handled back in Las Vegas. It mirrors it almost identically. So it's reality. It's reality. Um, and when asked to evaluate it, uh, I was struck by two things, one positive and one negative. First of all, um, this guy had a lot of special conditions imposed upon him by the court and we were so narrowly focused on addressing these special conditions that I think we may have lost sight of the bigger picture. Um, we sort of had blinders on whenever we would uh, meet with him out at his house or at his job site addressing these special conditions to the neglect of these other equally important financial conditions in his life. Mm -hmm. That said, I think we did one thing right, and I'm not just saying that because my supervisor's watching, um, <laughs> and that is that we had But it's a good thing you said it. <laughs> And that is we had developed an extensive collateral network. Um, unlike when we were talking with the offender, when we talked with his friends, with his supervisor, with his coworkers, with his adult children, with his wife, the conversation was more interactive, more two-way. And because of that, they saw that we were genuinely interested in helping this guy. And when this problem arose, they fortunately felt comfortable enough to come and talk to us about it. And so I think that collateral network uh, was invaluable. So two lessons learned here. Use those special conditions to the extent possible. Make them work for you, but don't get so overly focused on them that you get tunnel vision. And the second one is use those collateral contacts. Network, 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 and get to know the offender in the larger context. So important. Yeah. Danny, reactions? Well, Mark, I don't think it's really uncommon for these kinds of problems to um, not be as readily shown in supervision as other things that are more immediate, uh, such as uh, dirty urine screens right. or new convictions. Those kinds of things are very immediate, very right. urgent, right. and very uh, obvious. Very obvious. And uh, those are the kinds of fires that probation officers with heavy caseloads are very often in the position of rushing around to put out. Uh, also, sometimes we're, if you're carrying a heavy caseload, just inundated with information about the offenders. For example, we know that uh, every month, during the first five days of the month, each offender is to fill out a monthly report form. Now, there is a financial section, of course, on that report form. It asks, what was your income? What were your expenses? Did you have any overdue bills? Mm -hmm. So often, you get so much information, just a cursory glance, and then uh, it's filed. So taking the extra time to really look at that information that we already have in hand sometimes can be our uh, best tip-off to something going wrong. Mm -hmm. So you've hit on a critical point here. Look, you guys have heavy caseloads. A lot of the stuff is under the radar screen to begin with, so sure. you're not going to pick up on it eventually. And basically, what it sounds to me like what you're saying is, you know, to, to the extent possible, try to remain conscious here of 
what could possibly be going on. Try to dig a little deeper, especially you know if you can have the if you have the time to do it, and to the extent possible, use your traditional supervision vehicles to do that, like the monthly reporting form. That's exactly right. Many times the answers are already there. Right. Right. Um, okay. Uh, without further ado, let's go out to our Push to Talk site in Nevada Probation. Nevada Probation, are you there? Hi, Mark. Tim Jenkins out here in Sin City. Welcome, Tim. Hi, how are you doing? Fine, fine. Reactions, thoughts, questions, anything come to mind based on either this specific question, the vignette, or anything we've said thus far? Mark, just to say and clarify that uh, Scott had the the narrow focus. I had a real open mind, so I would have caught this problem. <laughs> just joking, Scott. Uh, but seriously, I just wanted to state, if I could, uh, the importance of a collateral network and how that can uh, really benefit in the supervision of a offender. Um, instead of just one, or in, in Scott and I's case, two officers supervising an individual, by contacting neighbors, friends, family, you're uh, recruiting others who have an interest in seeing this offender complete supervision satisfactorily. Right. So I, I can't stress that enough how important it is to set up this collateral network and uh, to take the time to do that. So just to sort of put a, a fine point on it here, you're using the collateral network to, it, to, to help supervise, basically. Exactly. Right. Um, Scott, any reactions to that? Is that ring true to you? Now exactly. that your partner has put the blame entirely on, on, on your shoulders? Yeah, yeah we, we try to develop as extensive a network as we can. These people have known the offenders uh, a lot longer than we have. They're with them daily. They know their moods. Uh, and they're going to be the first ones to know when things are going wrong. Um, and so I can't overestimate, uh, overemphasize how important that is. Mm -hmm. Danny? Well, I think that uh, it is extremely important. It would be very easy in this situation to just tell the offender, this is what you have to do, and give him a list. Um, but in the end, the effectiveness, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think the effectiveness would be there the way it was in this particular case that uh, they used those resources very effectively, I think. Thanks very much, Tim, for that comment and, the, and those points. Uh, my understanding is that we've got a fax in from the field. Uh, let's go to Mark Maggio for that. Mark? Okay, Mark, uh, two questions that get to the issues that both Scott and Danny uh, just touched on. Um, how can we reconcile or balance the need that Danny mentions for effectiveness and the equally pressing need for efficiency? And Scott, uh, sort of tagging on to that, could you or did you, were you able to empower the offender so that you were able to back off and let him take over the budgeting role? Yes. Good question, uh, and, and provides an interesting segue to the to the next question that's listed in the participant guide, which is has to do with the positives and negatives, or the 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 appealing and unappealing aspects of the approach. Scott, you want to start yeah. us off? Exactly, um, and that's what I really like about this approach is that it's not simply a quick fix solution. Mm -hmm. um, we are teaching this offender how to work through and solve problems in the future. Uh, it's all too easy as probation officers when when we get a problem from, from an offender to sort of take it out of their hands and deal with it on our own, that would be the easy thing to do, but mm -hmm. we're really the only ones who are benefiting at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in this case, um, this guy is, has a definite term of supervision, and in the future he's going to continue to experience these problems. Mm -hmm. We've taught him how to, how to work through a problem. Mm -hmm. Hopefully in the future when he experiences a problem, he will at least have one point of reference he'll have one positive uh, learning experience, one positive problem-solving experience. Mm -hmm. He will hopefully remember that he has uh, numerous options when mm -hmm. faced with a problem, that he can rely upon his family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, so these sorts of things are very important and uh, probably the most beneficial aspect of this approach. So you're really educating this offender. Uh, it's about, and for me, that's a, a court educator's perspective, that's a particularly interesting perspective, that you're, you're, you're not just teaching them how to, you're, you're not just getting the fish for them, you're teaching them how to fish. Exactly. Yeah. It, uh, it would be a lot easier to have simply handled the problem for him, but uh, not as beneficial. Right. Danny, reactions? I think it is a very brave approach. Uh, anytime you want to bring in family members or want to bring in um, other uh, collateral contacts such as the employer, it takes more time and it takes more effort. But in the end, 
hopefully the, um, it will be more effective. Of course, um, we always have to make those judgment calls about effectiveness versus efficiency. Mm -hmm. If you have 65 people that uh, have some sort of problem every day, you have to make uh, some judgments. Where is the best use of my time and my resources? And uh, I just don't think there's um, a form or, or a particular model that can really tell us that. Mm -hmm. It just comes with time, and you have to use some uh, intuition to mm -hmm. choose the battles where you can be the most effective. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, because you sort of touched on one of the more unappealing aspects, potentially, which is the sort of this right. front-end inefficiency. So maybe we can get a little crossfire going here. Uh, Scott, what's your reaction to, 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 Danny's, uh, to Danny's comments? In terms I, of picking and choosing and that kind of thing. Yeah, obviously you need to pick and choose and uh, see where you can do the most uh, good. But that's what we do every day, and that's what we're paid to do, uh, make professional decisions. We priorita prioritize every day when we're in our office, when we're out in the field. And we do so on these sorts of cases by sense of urgency. I mean, this guy, his life was falling down around him, and so it was very urgent. And um, also it was important that this offender... Uh, was receptive to our to our idea, and so we knew that it uh, wouldn't be forcing it down his throat, and he would be cooperative. Um, and so again, that's the sort of thing that you do. You, you prioritize and you make those decisions. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do. That's what we get paid very well to do, right. and that's what we should do. Right. Interesting. Um, let's go out to uh, Mississippi Northern. Uh, because I know that you guys have had a chance to discuss this uh, in your district. We've talked about it over the phone, Danny McKittrick and I have. Uh, what do you all think about this approach? What are some of the uh, positives, some of the negatives, some of the appealing, some of the unappealing aspects? Hi, this is Laura Wright speaking for Mississippi Northern. Um, we felt that the probation officer's approach was effective. We felt he obtained pertinent information from the daughter by asking uh, probing questions. We also felt he was able to get all of the parties involved together for a meeting and he did so quickly and we felt he was able to do so quickly because he had a good rapport with the family, the employer and the offender. Interesting. Reactions? Again, the extensive collateral network is mm -hmm. so important. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Um, I, my understanding is that we've got a call from Becky in D.C. in the probation office. Becky, are you here? Yes, I am. Hi, Becky. What's your question or, or, or reaction? Um, actually, I wanted to find out if, um, I'm sorry, the officer's name escapes me now, um, but if Scott, yeah. if he That's and right. his partner um, addressed where the offender's money was going, whether it was drugs or alcohol or um, what the issue was there, since apparently he didn't have any to, anything to show for um, the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. And perhaps not surprisingly, he was gambling his money away. Um, and again, uh, I back up and I say we were going in with, with blinders on. And for all I know, there may have been betting slips on the table as I'm talking to him about his uh, community service. Um, so uh, that's what reinforces to me that every time I go into a situation now, and, and of course this was the very first case I ever had, let me say. Whenever I go into a situation, now I step back and I try and take a look at the bigger picture and the offender's life situation as a whole. I don't always necessarily focus on those very narrow court-ordered conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Any reactions to that? Well, uh, everyone's life is a tapestry. You know, the probation <laughs> officers as well as the offenders. So we uh, find over time that one thing is connected to the next thing to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the betting slip on the table uh, put it down the road is connected to the paycheck, is connected to the employer. So you have to take a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I want to get to the last question because it, it has to do with next steps. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, Danny, how do you handle the next steps? We saw in the vignette, for example, that at the end, the officer was saying, hold on a second, let's talk about budgeting. He was looking toward the future. Mm -hmm. uh, what would your next steps be, or what were they in that case? Yeah, I think it would be very easy in this situation for the probation officer to say, okay, problem solved and move on. Um, however, I think that the probation officer should view this as simply a stopgap measure, uh, which will now allow him to address the underlying problem, uh, the bigger underlying problem, in a uh, more methodical fashion. Mm -hmm. In our case, uh, we assessed where the offender was financially, and he was at a very low level, and we uh, throughout the term of supervision, continue to reassess. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
On successive visits to the home or in the office, we address very basic financial and budgeting issues. On our first occasion, we saw the need to address the differences between needs and wants. Mm. Uh, while For this, example. Yeah. While this guy uh, knew that he had to have groceries, and that's a need, he also believed that premium movie channels were a necessity and not simply well, aren't they? a want. <laughs> <laughs> He'd always had them, right. and uh, everyone he knew had them, so he thought it was a need. Um, so, so we got him to see the differences between needs and wants. Mm -hmm. On another visit, uh, we sat down and we put pen to paper, and we developed a budget for him, mm -hmm. uh, actually seeing his cash flow, what was coming into the house and what was going out, had a really big impact on him, uh, seeing the limits of his cash flow. Uh, on yet another visit, we discussed the uh, problem with high interest rates on his credit cards. Mm -hmm. uh, he would whip out his credit card uh, on every purchase and didn't realize the impact that 21% interest on a pizza had to his uh, bottom line. So very small baby steps for this guy mm -hmm. uh, and continued reassessment throughout the term of supervision. Mm -hmm. Danny, uh, we're running out of time, so I want to go very, very quickly to New York Western. New York Western, do you have anything for us in terms of reactions to what the next steps might be? Yes, Mark, this is Ian Marie Cerati. Um, what I thought I would do, since we already discussed that we don't want to reinvent the wheel, um, I would actually send this individual possibly to a money management program, which may include consumer credit counseling. Um, since it's our job to help the defendant, we also need to know what community resources are available to us. There you go. And this might be a good situation where we could refer the defendant somewhere else. I'm glad you made that point. We've talked about making references or referrals to community credit, community credit counseling agencies, uh, and, and I think your, your last point sort of harkens back to earlier in the, in the program where we were talking about the importance of having community resources at hand, like community credit counseling who can help an offender like this with specific life skills deficits. So thank you guys for, for, for adding that. Uh, I'm wondering if, if we're sort of coming to the close of the, of the program, so now's a good time to ask if anybody has any final comments from any of the Push to Talk sites uh, on anything we've heard here today. All right, we're going to wrap it up then. Uh, we're just about out of time, uh, though I'm sure we could continue this conversation for hours. Clearly, this is a population of defendants and offenders that continues to grow in the federal system. Uh, and by developing and sharing strategies for investigation and supervision, officers will be able to manage that, that population more effectively, uh, more efficiently, and maybe even with fewer headaches. Um, the result can be an overall balanced caseload that protects the community and helps one become a more productive, productive member in it. I'd really like to thank the panelists, including our Push to Talk sites. Your participation really brought home some points to consider. Um, this thing would not have been as, as, as lively without you. Thanks to all of the participants. If we didn't have a chance to get to your question or facts, our sincerest apologies. We'll try to incorporate them into our d online discussion in April and May. And for more about that, you can contact me at the center by phone or email. My email address is msherman at fjc.gov. After we take a look at a brief summary, Mark Maggio will be back from so with some final words. Mark said that's all the time we have for today. To those who still have questions to be answered and comments to be made, remember you can continue this discussion in the online conference coming up in April. District representatives should contact Mark Sherman for more details. Keep an eye on the FJTN Bulletin for our next Special Needs Offenders program which will focus on computer crime. Remember to fax in your participant rosters and evaluations because we need your feedback as we plan additional FJTN programs. And with that, thanks for participating, and please enjoy the rest of your day.